This is The Second Studio, hosted by the Architecture and Design Office fame. My name is David Lee, and with me is Marina Bordarone, and this week it's the two of us, and we're doing a fellow designer episode, and we're answering questions from two listeners. Um, but broadly, the topic is transitioning from being a student to being a professional and practicing. So we're going to talk about what to expect when you make that transition, how to prepare for that transition, and, well, those are two big questions. So that's pretty much it, right? Yeah, I think it was pretty good. Uh, and I of course, so if you have any questions, uh, keep reaching out to us. Absolutely. Sponsors. We're supported by Skyframe. Skyframe is the world's leading frameless sliding doors and windows system. Their products feature large glass panels that span from floor to ceiling, flush transition, minimal hardware to create seamless connection between the interior and the exterior. Their system is top tier, ultra smooth and low profile. So how do they do that? Well, they're a Swiss company and they're all about precision. They develop and manufacture all of their premium products in Switzerland at their own state of the art production facility. So click on the Skyframe link in our episode notes to learn more. My dear fellow architects, do you know the current spend on your budget? Can you forecast your next six months of performance? Do you know the status of all of your projects? Have your team hours been effectively allocated? If you struggle to answer these questions quickly and easily, then you need to explore Monograph. Monograph is a performance management platform. It helps you and your firm make better day-to-day -day decision and anticipate what's next with powerful forecasts. It's designed by architects for architects. Monograph gives you less obscurity, more visibility, less ambiguity, more clarity, less admin, more design. You have to see it to believe it. Your performance becomes a lot easier to manage because it's no longer hiding from you. Tap the Monograph link in our show notes to see for yourself. This is The Second Studio with myself and Marina. Here we go. Okay. Here's the first one. I graduated from a certain university in the US this past May with a degree in architecture and I'm currently feeling stuck. Many of the people I graduated with are so excited to start working and don't seem scared to start. Mm -hmm. A lot of them already have found jobs or they're in the interviewing process. For some reason, I'm scared to take that next step to look for a job. I've been in school for so long that it has become my identity and I don't know how to make a comfortable transition to working. I know I struggle with change and I've been comfortable and happy while in school, so I'm scared for such a big change to working life. I just hope I will enjoy working and that I will be happy since I will be doing this for so many years to come. That's great. That's great. And I already answered this question, so I'm going to look at my notes. <laughs> oh, God, you cheater. Uh, hit yeah, me with your so answer. It's, so it's a, it, I think it's a healthy feeling. Um and honestly, I think probably the classmates that don't seem scared, they are scared. They're just probably not, not showing it or not talking about it. But it is it is scary. But it's also super exciting. And I think maybe, you know, uh, students who just graduate should focus on that. It's like, it's a really big milestone in someone's life to finish school mm -hmm. and go off to do what they've been trained to do. But well, they should focus on what? Focus on the transition? Is on, it? On, on being excited about oh, it okay. rather than being scared, mm -hmm, right? Like mm -hmm. you should per mentally celebrate that milestone and think that you've made it to that point. Now it's time to get to the next point. And yeah. you're not the first person going through it. You're not the last one going through it. It's normal to be scared, but just, just go for it. Don't let that stop you from moving forward, mm. you know? Um I think that person said that they've been in school for a long time and it, they kind of feel like this is their identity. Yeah. And and I can understand that. And there is something very comfortable about being in a place for a long time, being familiar with everything and just kind of feeling comfortable, right? And it goes back to, I think, things that we, we say uh, pretty often in the show, like being comfortable, being uncomfortable, <clears throat> right? Yeah. And school is eventually becoming a very comfortable environment after you get familiar with it yeah. and stepping into the profession and probably any profession, honestly, you have to be comfortable not being comfortable. So this is basically the first step of going through that feeling and that kind of attitude <laughs> is transitioning from school to the work <clears throat> environment. Yeah. I think also you shouldn't put too much pressure on that first job because you're fresh out of school, you know. Are you reading my, my answers? No. Well, okay, we're on the same page then. <laughs> uh, and and I think that sort that could participate in the feeling of being scared is sure. the feeling of failing. <laughs> you know, getting to that next step, mm -hmm. right? Being rejected at job interviews, not finding a place that you like, having to apply to a bunch of places. Like it's kind of a daunting process and a little bit <clears throat> overwhelming and disarming, and um, you don't really know what you're doing because it's the first time you're doing <clears throat> it. 
But so I think just just apply, just apply, get a first job, work there for three months, and then go somewhere else. Like you know, take it baby step by baby step. Um, it's not it's not like you have to commit to the, to this next first step for the rest of your life. Like that's where your career is going to be. Hopefully, if it works <laughs> out. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you can change career. Like there's no there's no like you know forever and ever type of thing um, for anybody. So I would say just acknowledge that you're scared. You know, and then just just move on, because it's not gonna help you. Okay. No, it's true. It's not gonna help <clears throat> you. It's gonna make you doubt of yourself. It's gonna make you not reach out to offices to apply for a job. It's gonna make you want to stay live at mom and dad and not actually find your own place, move to a new city, and like start your life. Yeah. So, and if you have if you have friends, I don't know, just ask them how do they do it? How comfortable are they with with doing what they're doing? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Do they have a plan? Do they have tips? You know, you're not alone. If you're scared and alone, that's not good. So don't be scared and don't be alone. <laughs> okay. So just stop being scared. Um, I do think that there, this person's sensation of that they've become comfortable in school and they've been in actually, I like the way they phrase it, that they've been a student for so long that that feels like it's their identity and they don't know anything else outside of that. It is an interesting point because it's an interesting way to say that. Because I think a lot of folks these days have that same feeling, whether or not they're as conscious about it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for architecture, it's a five-year program typically, or people do a four plus two. So you're talking about five to six years, not including any other uh, graduate level or other, whatever other studies you want to do. And we were meeting with a friend the other day, not in architecture, but they've been in school for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of um, more and more people for sure are in higher education for just a longer period of time and I think maybe because you're scared <laughs> yeah that's part of it <clears throat> and I can certainly um, sympathize with what this uh, listener is saying because I certainly have the same feeling I think that's also why some architecture students graduate they practice for just a few years and then they go back to teaching or then they start teaching rather and once they start they never stop because they can't escape the academic setting, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the academic setting has its positives, but I think there is some of that too. Like mm -hmm. people not, because it, it's a real bummer to to go through a grueling five to six years to finally, probably around year four, four and a half, start to figure your shit out, start to figure out um, how to do projects. And just when you're getting your feet under you, um, in my case, at least, then you're tasked in the last year with doing a thesis, which is a new thing. And by the end of it, you maybe sort of figure out what this whole thesis process was about. And then suddenly, boom, you graduate. Now you have to start all over with a brand new system, yeah. a whole new, more gigantic world you have to contend with. And there's very easily a sensation of like, oh. <laughs> Really? I, I just went through all of this. I busted my ass for six years and now I got to start over again. And now everyone's telling me that what it means to practice architecture is very different from doing it in school. So what the fuck? Um, so I get it. I get it. <clears throat> oh, wow. What a reassuring uh, response. <clears throat> yeah, no. And, you know, no, it's interesting the, the what, what this person's saying, like my my identity has become being in school. Mm hmm. And they don't really know like, how to move on from there. And it's actually interesting because I feel like maybe a lot of students sometimes are a bit too confident in who they are stepping into the real world <clears throat> to the point where they could seem a little bit arrogant, honestly. True. Um, so I think it's first super important that you acknowledge that this is what your identity is right now. Like you're actually aware of it. But it should be, again, super exciting to think about the fact that, okay, well, now you have to define who, you, what your next identity is going to be, you know, like you're not just, just thinking that you know it all, like you, you're going to define mm -hmm. yourself, you're going to find yourself in a new, you know, in a new world, in, a, in new situations. And that's <coughs> extremely exciting. Yeah. Some of the, the most successful people when they're students or when they're young professionals are the ones who enter school or enter the profession without a whole lot of preconceptions or a whole lot of um, ego, like you yeah, said, yeah, yeah. or anything wherein they're 
head, they think I've figured it out. I know what I want. I know that this is, it should be this way. It should not be that way. And in other words, that they are not closed off to things. Um, I think it's a great perspective to have whilst also somehow managing to, managing to be very dedicated and even aggressive in the job application process and, you know, hunting for offices yeah, yeah, yeah. that you want to work at and doing good work, which takes a lot of effort. You know, to be honest, I always felt <clears throat> from the age of five years old all the way to maybe 25 or so that when I was around peers who were my age um, and they were ultra confident in who they were or uh, some other thing, I always found that I, I was always skeptical. Um, because in my view, it, it it's like, how can you have so much confidence about this thing when you're that young? And, you know, I'm only a second year in architecture school. You're only a second year in architecture school. So how is it that you feel like you figured it all out? I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, one should have confidence and in their beliefs, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, it's that, that, that balancing or managing to be both of being confident and... and, and and completely open and um what it goes back to basically as cheesy as it sounds like like we are work in progress yeah right <clears throat> and i think being aware of that and being mindful of that um should help anybody especially in, in this kind of life transition the other thing too is i think i'm trying to like think back you know when i graduated from school and i was about to enter like the the practice and like be an adult basically if i had any of this like I'm scared type of feeling and I don't think I did or maybe I forgot that I was which tells you that eventually <laughs> you forget right but I think also what happens is if you start having too much downtime mm. after you graduate that's when you start questioning things and thinking and wondering and it could be good it could also like kind of put you in like a, a dog hole so yeah, what is it? It's paralysis by analysis. Yeah. yeah, you know, like you you start thinking about things a bit too much that it completely freezes you from moving forward. So I don't know. Maybe an advice would be like, just 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 go on to the next step. Like, don't let yourself stop for too long, because it might actually like not help you at all. Like I remember graduating, and I think it was a week later or like a few days later. Like I started applying to to jobs like looking looking for jobs from france to new york right and right. I, I don't think i was scared like i mean that, you know looking back that was kind of a pretty big move for us to just move into a place where we knew nothing and no one i knew nothing about the the working world uh really in the u.s in france yeah. Yeah, right. and then <laughs> in the u.s absolutely not yeah <laughs> you know so yeah. um and and that being said, it was actually maybe better that I didn't know that much uh, because therefore I wasn't maybe not as scared or maybe I was too naive or yeah. maybe I had a bit too much confidence, you know, in the <clears> fact <throat> that it would work out. But it actually well, led me to do that. One of the things we hear very often, it's true for our own lives um, and it's true for a lot of the guests that have been on the show because they say it on the show, is that um, kind of a, a superpower, that's, those are my words, is when you're naive enough to just go try something yeah. and you're not and you're not aware or you choose to be ignorant of all the potential disasters that could come with whatever thing you're embarking on. Um, you know, as Marina's kind of... A, was alluding to um, after school, the transition from school to to working um, was not just, oh, I'm going to apply to a job in my local town where I graduated from or the state even. Yeah. It was moving to a different state or moving to a different country um, with basically two uh, check-in suitcases <laughs> and then crashing on a uh, cousin's uh couch for a couple of weeks while we try and find jobs so like you know i i think there is definitely something about not overthinking and i think that i'm just thinking anecdotally like f for me that transition had less to do my concern was less less with um what is it going to be like to work in an office because i didn't really know what that was going to be mm -hmm. like so i had no 
there was almost no reason for me to be concerned or to fear because I just had no, I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen. And frankly, I didn't care because I knew I wanted to practice. So yeah. whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. And if it's great, it's it's great. If it's not, then I'll switch jobs or whatever else. But a big part of the transition had more to do with lifestyle and being in a new place and being in a city that I wanted to be in. And frankly, less to do with like offices. I didn't really care about the offices. That was far secondary. Um, well, I think also back at that time, like in, in, you know, internet and the medias, and even the medias around architecture wasn't as heavy as it is today. So there was a little bit more unknown. Not maybe. You know, for students. Uh, I, I, yeah, that's that's probably true. I mean, for sure though, the transition from being a student to practicing is a really big one. Um, yeah. There's there's no. There's that. That's the fact. There's no way that we. I could say it's. It's not that. And it might sound intimidating because of that fact, but you know, um, that's just what it is. And also, as you were saying, all of your classmates are going to do the same thing, and even the classmates who have this this uh, air about them of being very confident, very professional, and they've landed a job at SOM in San Francisco or New York, or they landed a job at I don't know. OMA or I don't know, whatever yeah. office, right? Oh my gosh, they've had it figured out. Wow, look at them. They wear like skinny jeans and like Ray-Bans and whatever the fuck, <laughs> which was not the thing now, it was the thing then. And like, uh, they've got it figured out. Like, what am I going to do? Um, I wouldn't worry about that because one, they haven't gotten it figured out. That's not, that's not, it's, just, it's false. And two, you know, architecture is a long game, so it really does not matter what all of the fresh graduates do between years one and one and two, let's say that yeah. it really doesn't matter what you do when, what offices you work at. It makes no, no fucking difference in the long term. And to put it in perspective, if you're a person who's a fifth year or fourth year or sixth year, think back to when you were a first year architecture I know. student, I know. right? And if you're concerned about the transition from being a, uh, a, a fifth year student to being a professional, you were probably also concerned back when you were in high school, now you're jumping into architecture, right? Mm -hmm. And so you jumped into architecture back when you were a first year. Think back to that first year. Did it really matter, like your skill set in first year? No, it made no difference. By the time you get to year five, that's when it really makes that's when you really see what a person is like in the academic setting. The same thing applies for the professional setting, but even on a longer term, right? Years one to two, eh, you know, do your best, have fun, work at good places, try and do good work, try and get paid, be in a city you like. That's the best you can do, right? Now, if we're talking about your career over the course of zero to five or zero to 10 years, that's really where, where the math matters, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, that's not to say you should not care about the first two years, but it's to take a little bit of pressure off of anyone who's listening who is feels like they're paralyzed or feels like they're totally unprepared. You might be both of those things, but I'm telling you, if similar to that first year student to fifth year student, if you just keep working and you're a good human being and you do certain things, it works out. Yeah, and I think also, it's, you know, once you once you graduate from college, it's not so much about your classmates anymore. No, like, yeah. it, it, there is no teacher who's got to do, well, this person got more interviews than this person. So, you know, Bobby is doing better than everyone else in the class. No, no one cares anymore. You're on your own, right? And the choices you make is for yourself. It's for your life. The only person who cares is you. <laughs> right? The only person who should care is you. Yeah. But the, maybe you shouldn't care about other people in a way. No, you shouldn't care about other people. And, 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 and you know, it's not because everybody's heading to New York that you should head to New York too. Like, think about... Everyone should head to New York. Well, well everyone <laughs> should probably head to New York at some point just because, you know, for architecture, it's, it's a pretty uh, incredible place. But, the, the, you know, that being said, it's like, it, it's kind of, it's kind of the time for you to think about who you want to be, where you want to be, what you want your life to be without having to have the answers yet, yeah. right? Yeah. You just kind of have to um, kind of like open up the question at this time of your life, but you don't have to have the answers because you won't have the answers. And if you do, it might be the wrong answer at this time, you know? I'll also describe what happened with ourselves and then and my group of friends when we graduated versus where we all are now, which is many years after we've graduated, to kind of talk about how the paths work for different people. So <clears throat> when I graduated, a group of us uh, from my same school, my same class, all end up moving to New York City. Um, I don't know if that was At part different of, times, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, we were slightly stuck. Some of us moved within like a few weeks. Some of us moved within a few years, but we all kind of migrated uh, roughly at the same time. 
you know, ish. And that was the first big place after school we all ended up. And everyone started off by practicing in architecture, right? We all worked at different offices. Some people worked at really big name offices. Others worked at fucking micro offices. Others worked at experimental ones. You, you the, the the range of offices. Pretty much everyone we hit one of those marks between between yeah. the group, right? And in school, like you were saying, comparing yourself to others and what jobs they get and what interviews. In school, that's your value system is based on these, you know generally these fancy design offices that have big names, right? Which can be great places to work at. A lot of times they're not, frankly. Um, but once you start practicing and you and you and you work for about five years, you realize like, eh, that's not really all there is to it, right? There's other stuff that comes into play, such as what is it actually like to work there? Forget the designs they produce, the buildings they produce and the name of the office. What is it actually like to work there, both in terms of culture, in terms of what am I learning? Am I just cutting blue foam for two years? Um, what am I getting paid? Uh, uh, I said culture, but what are my, my colleagues are like? Mm -hmm. Are they helping me get to my next step of passing my exam? Like all this other stuff becomes much more to the forefront of your thinking. And the funny thing is, I do remember having the sensation of, well, that this person in school, like they weren't great in my view, and they worked at this big name office, and they <laughs> and they're working at this big name office. Like I'm jealous because they're working on these giant projects. But then you look at the other five categories I mentioned, it's like, okay, well, they're being underpaid. They're doing nothing but blue phone models and yada, 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 yada. I'm like, okay, well, I don't really know who's the winner here because yeah. they have the name on the resume, but they're not gaining anything else, right? And other times I've worked at offices, which on the outside might have uh, appeared more desirable. Yet this other person I knew worked at a no-name office, stayed there for uh, whatever period of time, is now making way more money than I, than I am. And they have more responsibility and they get to have authorship over their work. Okay, who's the winner, right? So it, um, it's not to say that in those paths you should choose over the other. It's just to say that maybe the the the, the framework of your thinking that you have as a fifth year student is not going to be what's going to matter to you as a full fledged practicing professional adult, you know, after year f four or three ish around there, right? Um, things get very different. Yeah, that's a good point. The other thing I was going to say is, you know, he's concerned about, I think it's a he. I chatted with this person beforehand, so I might have, well, they <laughs> um, are concerned with this transition. And part of the transition is also the people that you're surrounded by, right? We could talk about the transition in terms of your daily lifestyle of now you have a set, they're nine to six, nine to nine job, the technical information you don't know, all the salary, all that stuff. There's all that stuff true, but it's also the people you're surrounded by. And school culture is very strong because you're in a studio setting with your friends and you're hanging out probably late at night, eating pizza, drinking beer, maybe in the studio and, and drawing stuff. And that's like the culture. And you get into a professional setting. Suddenly now you're not surrounded by people who are your same age. You're surrounded by people who are like... <laughs> your parents age or your grandparents age and you have a project manager you're working with or a partner and it's it's just very different and everyone dress potentially maybe a little bit more formally and it's 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 just a it's a different environment right what i would say is that in my experience most offices and for sure i think they're really good offices a lot of the people in those places still feel very strongly and hold architecture school very close to their hearts. It's very dear to them. Even though they went to school like 50 years ago and they were using May lines and they, their school experience was very different than yours, most architects, that education um, experience they went through still is very, very meaningful to them. And it's kind of, in my view, it's 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 probably, aside from avoiding shitty clients, it's it's probably the, the greatest common denominator and the glue that kind of holds us all together mm -hmm. so don't think that when you go and you're working next to someone who's much older and they wear a suit and a tie that they don't get it that they don't have the passion for pure creativity and whatever took place in your studio because i i can guarantee that 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 spark is still within them or it once was and they miss it but it's it's, it's a common ground is what i'm saying so you're not entering into totally foreign territory yeah i think you know that's yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, even the places that you decide to reach out, maybe if you feel like it's a little bit intimidating for you, don't reach out to offices that have 400 people. Maybe reach out to a smaller scale office. True. You know, maybe 
reach out to offices that you feel like their work is meaningful to you or there is some sort of common interest to make you feel a bit more comfortable, you know, reaching out and having conversations with them. Um, I also like your point about not feeling like your first office is the... Like you don't put too much pressure on the first office. No, and and I yeah. hope that everybody who starts their first job that it's not going to be their last job, because mm. to me that would be extremely sad as mm. like a, a creative career to only have known like one way mm -hmm. to do things. And I'm saying that again because I'm thinking of like my educational experience, right? Being taught in one country and seeing like how other places are doing it. For me, workplaces is the same thing. You can just like go work for one office, you should kind of see what else is out there. So your first office is just your first office. Yeah. Don't get too emotionally attached to it. Don't put too much pressure on it. Yeah. Just you, you just need that one. It's yeah, the I, first I, one. Again, an easy comparison is look back to when you were a first year and imagine if you were a first year architecture student and you were choosing one of the what, 20 teachers that are at the, stu at the school and you chose one and that was going to be your one teacher for five years. That's crazy. You wouldn't do that. You would not want to do that, right? Um, so I think the same thing for yeah. sure. <clears throat> and now a quick break to thank the sponsors who support the second studio. We are supported by Enscape. Enscape is a real-time visualization and VR tool for the AEC industry. It is also a program that we use in our office. And we like it because one, it's a plugin and not a separate application, which means we can work natively in our modeling program, such as Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ArchiCAD, or Vectorworks. Two, it's super easy and versatile. We've used many other rendering programs and a lot of times they're just difficult to use. That's not the case with Enscape. We can do renderings, 360 degree panoramas, videos, and immersive VR experiences with a breeze. Thirdly, it renders in real time so we can see the light, shadows, and materials of the renderings as we're working. So start your free trial today by clicking the Enscape 3D link in our show notes. Are you tired of juggling multiple pieces of software and struggling with spreadsheets that aren't made for the realities of design and architecture in 2023? Built by and for designers and architects, Programmer's all-in-one suite of tools has everything modern studios need for every stage of a project. Mood boards, the world's best specification tools, procurement tracking, project management, and more. All smartly integrated, easily shareable, and always up-to-date, reducing time-consuming double handling and costly errors. Share your work in various formats, from PDF to client-friendly, up-to-date online dashboards. Join the ranks of leading studios using Programma today. Click the Programma link in our show notes to start for free. Fellow architects and interior designers, if you are looking to elevate your workflows, then we suggest using the BIM computer program, ARCHICAD. ARCHICAD leads the industry by enabling architectural and interior design firms around the world to freely design, supported by innovative technology that expands as far as the imagination can stretch. As ARCHICAD continues to evolve with technological advances, architects can push that technology to their advantage while working in an accurate model. Start your fully functioning free trial today by clicking on the ARCHICAD link in our episode notes. We got another question from another listener. Um, it says, hi, I really enjoy listening to your podcast. Oh, thank you. I'm an architecture student at So-So uh, University. I'm going into my fourth year and would really enjoy a podcast on transitioning into a professional environment and what to expect. I've mm. struggled with feeling like I'm lacking technical knowledge and having to teach myself things on my own. How should I best prepare for what would be expected of me in an office while in the world of academia? It's almost as if professors don't want to talk about the professional world of design. <laughs> well, there's a few reasons. <laughs> I'm going to be a dick. There's a few reasons why teachers don't talk about the professional world of design because they don't know it. Um, if you're a full-time faculty member, um, which there needs to be people like that, it's a good chance that they don't actually understand um, what it's like at the uh, infantry level to be in an office and they might not even understand what it's like to be in an office from a a, a partner or you know project manager level um and that's just that's part of that tension that exists between school and practice that will probably always exist so that's <laughs> that's my contradiction <laughs> to the question that's that's one answer <clears throat> but as far as what to expect huh i will say Generally, so all this has a big, like, you know, generally asterisk next to all this conversation um, that you can expect the environment to be far less loose and creative, right? Uh, I wish that wasn't the case, generally, but that is the case. And it's because what 
a practicing architecture office has to deal with, like the work they have to do, is very different from the work you do in school. So if we look at the phases of a of a building that an architect is an, an office is doing, you go from concept design, schematic design, design development, construction documentation, permitting somewhere within there, then you have selecting a contractor, then you have construction and you're working with the contractor throughout construction and then they close out. Look at all those phases, right? School, when you're in school and you're doing a project, how much of that do you do in school? You do concept design in school. Yeah, That's you might start dabbing into maybe DD. Maybe but... a little bit of schematic design and maybe a little bit of DD because you're tasked with doing one wall section or yeah. something with things that you probably don't even understand what you're drawing anyway at, at, at that uh, level. So it's to say that, you know, there's another like 80% of the job that doesn't happen in school, right? And that 80% of the job tends to be more of the, not tends to be, it is the more technical stuff. It's the construction detailing that level of technicality is the technical um, work in terms of coordinating with people, other professionals being very thorough and organized in how you communicate. It's the technical aspects um, also in terms of building codes and zoning codes. So those three things, and there's probably a few more that are missing, you know, occupy a huge portion of an architecture office's life. And therefore, when you enter that space, uh, it's going to feel different because that's just a lot of the heavy lifting. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, there's not, I mean, there is a lot of things you could do to try and gain some knowledge before you start. But honestly, I, think I, I feel like just, you know, from books and like looking at construction details and learning like BIM and, you know, like all of that stuff, like you could, but uh, I don't know, like if it's actually going to really bring you like 15 steps ahead of the curve when it's going to be your first day at the office like i don't know if it's worth it what i would say is enjoy your free time before you start working and and, <laughs> okay. and because that will happen until like much later you know and and then just go 200 percent into like your work once you start it's a healthy I, thing like and the, you, again, you're not being graded once you, if you show up the first day of the office and you know how to use like Revit, nobody is going to give you an A plus and put you at the next level on the project. No, you're still going to start with where they're going to decide where you're going to start. Mm. So it might make you feel a bit more comfortable, you know, knowing that you, you have a little bit of knowledge, but offices typically, if they're good ones, like should know that you just came out of school. It's like you know, you're not, the, the, you're, you're the, not the, expecting yeah. a newborn to start walking. Yeah, you know that's the same thing. Yeah, there's a few. Uh, so there's a few things in response. I do like the idea of taking the time to kind of enjoy life and have a little bit of a break, um, because I think that's important. Um, I do think that trying to learn some of these things on your own is is good. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I do agree that it's not going to get you 15 steps ahead. I would say that you should do it so that you feel more comfortable it's for primarily. So when you enter the office, you feel more comfortable asking questions and saying, hey, how does this thing work? Can you explain to this, uh, this detail uh, in more detail to me um, so I can understand it. So you have a, a little bit of something to work with. So you're not just stuck sitting there going, I had no idea what you're talking about. And, and so how do you, how do you learn those things? I mean, there's a lot of tutorials and stuff out there. I, I would, so I would approach learning, let's say software, like uh, a BIM program. Not with the intention of I need to become an expert at it or even in intermediate or even novice, just so that you, you're you a little bit more familiar, right? So when you, you enter the office, you're not starting from absolute zero um, and you feel like you're stagnant. Um, you, you, you're, you're, the ball is rolling, even if it's rolling very slowly, mm -hmm. it's already rolling. Um, for technical information, there's a lot of good actually books that uh, offices will have probably in house already. I mean the the graphic standards. Graphic um, standards was my bible. <laughs> yeah, all of the books my, by. It was my bible through all of my my time working on offices because there is a lot of different details and technicalities that you do not know and you cannot know yeah. because it really depends on a series of condition aligning to these specific details, right? So mm. depending on what kind of building you're working on, depending what the building is made of, is there existing condition and new conditions? Like there's so many variables that you can't know at all, right? But that book is extremely resourceful in at least answering some of those questions. So yeah, um, the books by Francis Ching are great uh, mm -hmm. for, again, 
beginner and actually some of the stuff is, is quite detailed uh for the basics of how things get constructed another and, thing and, you could do um it, well and those are books too that you'd be used for your exams if you decide yeah. to take the exam so you know it's more of a kind of a forever on the shelf yeah yeah absolutely book. Now, I, I think it's more about having just a basic understanding of the topics so you know how to ask questions in a way that are a little bit more coherent <laughs> is how I would put it. I suppose you could also reach out to, you know, some practicing architects and ask them if they'd be willing to have like a 15 minute or half hour call with your coffee and just say, I have questions about the profession. Um, can you answer them for me? Or say, I have a questions about, I don't know, something even more specific, permitting and whatnot. Or you could look up online, you know, um, look at like CD set, for example, of projects. Just get familiar with, okay, what goes into a drawing set, you know, like, how do you read drawings? Like, I don't know, like, I never knew how to read, uh, um, Technical. like, framing plans, yeah. you know. <laughs> They're very confusing to me the first time. I'm like, uh, what am I looking at, you know? Yeah. Um, so maybe <laughs> just, you know, just, it, again, they were like tiny baby steps, but they would probably make you feel a little bit less hesitant when you start. I think another thing you could do if you're in fourth year is... Um, I, I, I'm not promoting that every time, but you could do an internship for a month during the summer. Just intern at an office to just kind of like shadow people, like, you know, get exposed to things. And, and I also have a feeling that if you were to do an internship, let's say in your fourth year in an office, and let's say you really like that place, that you could potentially apply and get a job there because they already know you. Mm -hmm. You already know them. Uh, again, if you're going to stay there forever, then that's probably not the plan, but there could also be a way to get closer to you and your internships. It's just always internships <laughs> over and over and over. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's true. In terms of educating yourself, though, um, imagine, you know, let's say that there's no one else to reach out to. Um, hmm. Or reach out to a contractor that's in your hometown or whatever, you Better, know, like yeah. have coffee with them. Ask them if you can go on site and they could show you around for a day or two, you know, like I think there is like small things like that that just gives you little snippet appetizers of different things that happen in an office without, you know, having to, you know, have the burden of knowing it all before you start. Yeah. I mean, it might be more efficient to actually get in, get knowledge from other, uh, from professionals rather than trying to figure out things on your own. Um, as far as construction, technical information or you can watch this old house <laughs> <laughs> that's not bad and yeah for residential construction <laughs> i mean i i don't know i i think i i like the point you made of all of the offices they understand that you've just graduated so they don't have very high expectations in terms no. of your technical knowledge they might have zero expectations frankly as far i don't know what technical knowledge means but in this person but if you're talking about computer programs then they probably expect you to have a higher expectation of you than compared to construction technical knowledge. Like, I, I don't. I would never assume that a, a, a person who just graduated knows anything about that. And I don't no, really care, and, and honestly. No, and no one would ever put you in charge of designing no. the wall section of a new building the office is working on. Yeah. Oh, that would be extremely irresponsible. So what are other things, though, that they can expect that's, you know, different when they transition, when they make it out into the Well, I think ocean? being aware of the consultant is a good one. You know, oh. like working with, depending on the size of the office, but, you know, working with contractors is a big one that I don't think is taught in school so much. Or working with engineers mm. or landscape architects or even interior designers, you know, per se. Um, that's pretty different. The different phases of the project, like you mentioned, is not something that you really get exposed so much in school. Um, the exposure to clients, that's a little bit more difficult to to get a glimpse at unless maybe you do an internship and you, you sit into some of those client meetings to kind of see what's up. Yeah, I think you know? <clears throat> I think one of the biggest uh, differences in a medium-sized office, I don't know, 25 people, maybe more, or even smaller than that, um, there's a lot of hierarchy or more hierarchy than you're used to as a student. As a yeah. student, there's no hierarchy. It's just you and a teacher. That's it. And you might even be fairly independent and not really rely on your teacher for any kind of <laughs> valuable feedback because you don't believe what they're saying, like I did. Um, but when you get to an office, there's probably going to be you, there's the project manager, and then there's a partner. There's, so there's usually at least three levels, um, but the hierarchy is something that you're probably not going to be prepared for, and it's different. And I, I, I think tied with that, 
one of the things you can expect is how do I put this? Is that I, I think you have you'll find that you have to be much more proactive in asking questions to getting the information you want and proactive in learning and proactive in making contributions and proactive in everything. Because what happens in school, like the setting is everyone's always telling you what to do and they're making I've said this before in this podcast, they make requests of you all the time. Do this, do that, do this homework, do this presentation, this is the deadline, you know, and you're just tasked with basically just doing what they say and keeping up with it. But that institution, um, that setting is designed to educate you. It's designed to feed you knowledge. It's designed to make you grow. The professional setting, that is not its first priority a lot of times. Its first priority as a business is to complete the work, to get more projects, to do da 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 right? And yeah, they should be educating their employees, but that oftentimes falls way down on the list. So I think a lot of times new graduates end up in an office and I think it's very easy in a lot of places to just kind of sit quietly and do your work and then go home and then show up the next day and then quietly do your work and just wait until someone gives you things to do, which is not the mentality you should have. No, and it's definitely not the way people are going to want to keep you in their office. <laughs> Because well, you it, get it, lost in the cracks. You it's, know. it's not school, like you said. It's not like I'm giving you an assignment and and that you know you have to you have to complete it and and all of that. Like it's really you have to participate. You know, people are not going to tell you exactly how you're supposed to do the things they're telling you you have to be doing on this project. You're going to have to figure it out on your own and ask questions and and find the answers yourself. And maybe you find the wrong answers, but they will appreciate that you you try to find them on your own. You know, it's. I guess what I'm saying in a way is like the mentorship aspect, right? Yeah. In school, you're surrounded by men. You have like six mentors at any given period of time because you have six different teachers, right? You don't have that necessarily when you're practicing. If the office is good, then they assign someone to you and they say, okay, this is your your accountability buddy. Like you're going to look after this new uh, hire and you're going to take care of them and make sure that they are doing well and et cetera. But a lot of times, again, that doesn't happen. So you as that person, you have to be the one to, to just – be more vocal about stuff. Um, you don't have a lot of times. You don't have that mentor, and you have to find them or force people to be to act that way uh, about you. I, I have. I've always had this thought that it also depends on the size of the school that you're you're at. Um, like Berkeley, you see, Berkeley is a massive school, and I do think that if you went to Berkeley, for example, um, generally not specifically architecture, but you went to Berkeley and you managed to be very successful then you probably already have some of these um, ways of operating built within you. Because that's a school where it's it's so huge, the campus is so big, that unless you are you know, more proactive about these things I'm saying, you're just going to get swallowed up. You're going to get lost in the cracks. Well, I think it's just being kind of like more mature and independent. Like, you know, like if you start working in an office and you sit on your chair, you did your assignment, you're just waiting for someone to come and check on you and be like, did you do your assignment? Uh, it's not gonna work like you're doing your shit you're going to your project manager like hey here is my stuff look at it it's done what's next you know like the, yeah just be proactive about it I mean I remember working on projects in New York where I don't know let's say I had to work on a permit set for a building I had never done that before I'm yeah. like building code what is that where where is that what information do I need to put on the drawings and you know my boss was a nice guy, but he was busy managing a bunch of other projects. And it's kind of like, well, go on the website, do your research. Like you, It's kind of like you go about doing your work the same way you would go about doing an assignment, let's say, as a mature student mm. where you, d you don't know what the stuff is, where you have to think Just about where, yeah. where do I go for finding it? Okay, I found it. Okay, what exactly piece of the code do I need for this specific portion? You're not sure where well, you go see the senior project manager in the office you're like hey Bobby you know like I'm looking for this and Bobby is going to help you out it's going to be like well you should check this and also look at this and the more you ask questions in an office the the more you're going to learn the faster you're going to learn the more people are going to value you because they're going to see you're genuinely interested in being a, a good employee and a good person and, and in doing a good job so I, you know, you can't really like start asking people questions before you start working in an office. But uh, yeah, I but think, I think just preparing yourself to have that mentality. You yeah. know, whatever 
whatever it takes to get you there. It's, it's like reaching out to a bunch of strangers and have coffee with them to make you feel more comfortable asking questions to people you don't know. The other odd thing, I think because offices are, are much more structured than, than studio settings, like you have different types of employees. You have like the partners or the founders, and then you have um, HR, you have like accounting, you have a front desk person, you have interior designers, architects, you have technical architects, you have design architects, you have project manager, you have all these different people. And um, that's also that's something that's very different than when you're in school. When you're in school, it's just one type of person, student, and then again, teacher. And the student wears all the hats that I mentioned, you know, more or less. So what happens is as a result, an, an office can feel very foreign and kind of scary and maybe even even uh, intimidating because there's all these people there and but you don't talk to most of them or you don't talk to some of them at all because you have no reason to talk to them and they might say hi to you in your first day and then that's it and you have no idea who they are or what they do it's all foreign right and also people are a lot older and they have like kids and they, it's like it's, it's it's just a it's a it's a different crowd to be around and so I think that and it's intimidating, especially when you're the youngest one joining the club, you know, like, yeah. And so I think that what I would do, um, what I would have done in retrospect has been much more forward and just reached out to the person who I just based on superficial readings of them felt more comfortable with and say in an email, um, Hey, you know, uh, do you want to get lunch with me today? And just ask them like a shit ton of questions about life, about housing, about, you know, where to shop for groceries in this neighborhood. I would also ask them about the office and be like, who does what here? And they will give you probably a, a, they will spill the beans and they will give you a, a very long detailed and personal answer to your questions. And then I would do it again with a different person, and you're probably going to hear a different story. Oh, Rick is not an asshole. He's actually a really nice guy. And look, why is that? And But I think all that stuff, even the gossipy stuff, makes a really big difference in terms of feeling comfortable. Um, that's why it, it, when you work at an office, it takes like a year before you start to feel like in the groove and mm -hmm. you start to understand it, right? In school, you feel like you're in the groove by the time you get to fourth or fifth year or even third year perhaps – even when you have a different set of students around you, because you know the system and you've seen them around the campus anyway, you, you get it, right? It's it's not that different from studio to studio. You understand what's going to take place. In an office, though, the first office in particular, different ball game. So I don't know. Looking back for me, I would have just, yeah, gone out to lunch with people and they'll pay for your lunch. You know, you don't have to pay for the lunch and you get a free lunch, too. And just ask okay, a bunch of okay. questions. That's, that's, that's... No, but I'm I'm serious that people would do that. And also, th th here's the thing too: is that, and anyone who's working, you know this. Um, what do you do when the workday ends and you get drinks with your colleagues? You talk shit about other people. You talk <laughs> shit about your boss, and you talk about the pros and cons of X, Y, and Z and other offices. And I think as a new employee or a fresh graduate, you want to get into that information because it's helpful. First of all. Uh, in terms of, of making decision making and it'll make your life um, you'll be much more comfortable and you might hear some juicy stories yeah exactly <laughs> about your boss yeah, doing yeah, yeah. crazy stuff no, no but, yeah, but that I'm... makes a huge difference because like we would have uh, happy hours in one of the offices and one of the <laughs> happy hours I think we all had a, a little too much to drink but um, it's an interesting thing that the next Monday of work the office from my perspective, was totally different. Now, was it actually different on that Monday? Perhaps. Or was it the fact that now I felt more comfortable? Probably more of the latter. Um, so, yeah, that's my advice to go get drinks with people. <laughs> no, but like, I mean, you know, if the office is a good one, there will be someone who on your first day would be like, hey, do you want to go for lunch? I can show you around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm looking back. I, I had a, a few offices where that happens and it, it really helps you just feel more comfortable. It feels like you're being accepted. Because, you know, I mean, the person who hires you is not... It, it wasn't a decision of everyone in the office. It was a decision of maybe a handful of them. So you don't really know how the other people are going to welcome you or not welcome you. Yeah. And uh, depending on your age and your level of experience and your position, you might be thinking I'm, 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 maybe they see me as a threat to them. You know, so there is a little bit of like, I think on, on both sides, uh, apprehension of the new person or being the new person. 
Um, but I think going to get lunch with people in the office is a great way to just feel more familiar with it and happy hours too. I like your point about the you 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 might have actually more freedom than you think, um, because uh, with in problem solving things, oh. pre previous point that you made about like you said like permitting or something that you were just tasked with like you figure it out kind of deal. Yeah, and I think my boss was also testing me, be yeah. like, okay, I'm just gonna give you give her a question and see if she can figure it out. And that leads to the other part of the the listener's question, which is, you know, what would be expected of me in an office? Um, probably what they expect from you um, is mostly how are you going to problem solve things that you don't know how to solve. That's probably the biggest question. Are you going to are you gonna be proactive? Are you going to lead yeah. the efforts or the the research to the answer? You know, like are you going to take the back seat and just wait for everyone else to figure it out for you? You know, I um, I mean, yeah, I think it's. Again, it shows your interest, your dedication, your um, maturity too, uh, your personality. You know, we talk a lot about relationship with like clients and architects, but it's the same thing between employees and employers, right? What makes a great office is the team working well together. Yeah. I mean, I've been, <laughs> I've been in both offices where one was extremely toxic and one was extremely like friendly and like a kind of family feeling. And it makes it makes the world of a difference, and you know sometimes you could kind of tell or so in in the work what comes out of that. So, yeah. So I, I think there's there's a couple answers to the what the, what an office would expect of you. The first is is all of the basic things that that any employee should 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 do or should be, which is to be on time, be organized, be friendly, be a team player, all that stuff. Yeah. Which is kind of you know. A cliche or, or whatever, but it's like incredibly important. And if you can do that, it might separate you from a lot of the other folks anyway. I was talking to an interior designer not long ago, and they were like, you know, my big thing is that I do what I say. I, I do what I said I was going to do. And I over promise. No, I under promise and I over deliver, right? So if I say I'm going to complete this thing for you client within two weeks, probably it'll be done in a week and a half, but for sure it will, it will be done by two weeks. I don't mess up. And I was like, yeah, that, I don't know why it would be any other way. That's our just general mode of operating for us. So yeah. big deal. But she was like, but you know, because she's very successful, um, gets a lot of referrals and whatnot. And she's like, honestly, I feel like part of my success or a lot of it is just because I do what I, I say I was going to do. And there's a lot of people in, in her view, in her space, like they just don't do that. And so when they come across someone who actually does, um, just in life in general. I mean, think about, forget architecture, interdesign, and construction. Just think about all the people you interact with who say they're going to do something and then they don't. Oh, so so if you're the people. one person or one of the few people who does that, again, regardless of your, of your profession, your status, or your, anything else, you're going to be someone I'm going to call on. You're going to be someone who I'm going to want to hang out with because you're not going to flake or whatever it might be. So as far as expectations are all of those things, right? Also the expectations is like, again, going back to you being mature to problem solve things on your own. Even though offices should be very good at mentoring people, they don't want to handhold. No. Like there's a difference between mentoring and being a good educator versus handholding. They do not want to handhold. Because an office, you know, architecture offices, architects don't make a whole lot of money compared to a lot of other professions. They don't have, we don't have the time to be handholding you with like babysitting shit, right? And if I give you a task, I want you to figure it out. And if you truly can't, then I want you, and it crosses that threshold. Like you said, I'm going to observe you from a distance and see what you do. And then if it gets crosses that threshold, are you going to sit on your ass or are you going to go ask someone for help? And how are you going to ask for help, right? I felt bad because that office, I just went to the same guy every time I had a question. Well, I think <laughs> but, also... But, you know, it's like, well, if I can't figure it out on my own, I have to ask someone who I know and uh, I can just not do that. One of the mistakes that I see... This sounds contradictory to everything I've said, but one of the mistakes that I see that that new hires make is sometimes they don't allow themselves enough time to figure out something on their own, so they just pepper everyone with like small questions. But 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 there are questions they could have answered if they had spent like sometimes just five minutes thinking about it. You know, oh, where is that thing? Where is this thing saved? Okay, spend five minutes. To look at her folder, this is hyper specific. Look at her folder structure on her server, 
and see where it makes sense, right? You're looking for this thing. Okay, follow the path. Is it where you thought it would be? Yes. Then don't bug me about that, right? Are you the type of guy who doesn't have much patience if someone comes to you <laughs> in an office? No, I do have patience, but I but <laughs> I want to see that there is at least a sincere effort. And sometimes people they don't default, they don't default to solving it on their own or attempting it. Yeah. yeah they yeah. default to let me just ask somebody. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't want that because ultimately. All employers want to have their employers employees stay on for indefinite because it's the most efficient way to have an office. It's like the amount of money offices lose when an employee starts for like a year or six months and then they quit. It's like that's a deficit for the office, right? Um, and so thinking in the long term, what employers want are people who are responsible, people who can take care of the stuff so we don't have to babysit them because um, that's what's required. Like there's a... There is a massive amount of responsibility that gets placed on the individual in an office, um, and, uh, and sometimes if you bug that person every ten minutes, they can't do their job. So, <laughs> and sometimes there's zero oversight because there's just there's not the capacity to have that much oversight. That kind of all those layers of checks and balances. It's like I trust you; you take care of it, and that's a lot of trust to take to, to put into somebody. And yeah, and, and actually trust like that and responsibility also makes you grow a little bit faster. I mean, I remember one of my one of my job and my project manager left the office to start his own practice. You know, it was like super exciting for him, but <laughs> I was the only one working with him and I'm like, uh, how, how is this going to go? I mean, the project is about to start construction. Like, mm -hmm. what's, what's up? And, you know, my boss was trusting me enough, I guess, me doing my own research on the building code and all of that. Like, he was like, well, how about you, you take care of it? And I was like, <laughs> are you crazy, man? Like, <laughs> I don't know enough. I'm not qualified for this. But the fact that he put his trust in me, yeah. despite me probably lacking a lot of experience, made me want to figure it out and not disappoint him. Yeah. So it was actually, it was a big risk for him because he basically like, you know, uh, but they give me a project to deal with on my own. Yeah. And if I fucked up, well, that's his office that's fucking up. Yeah. But the fact that he put his trust in me really made me feel like, okay, I can, I cannot disappoint my teacher. I cannot disappoint, you know, that person because it, he's, he's counting on me to make it work. Yeah. I think the sensation a lot of graduates have when they start practicing is, is, oh shit, this is for real. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm actually seeing, witnessing and a part of, literally millions or tens of millions of dollars being spent and in this permit set construction document set we have to get it right and yeah, there's I mean, no <laughs> not getting it right like there is a, a seriousness that hits you in the face very strongly that does not exist in school this is the thing too about students that are the pet peeve like why aren't you pinned up oh well xyz abc i had all these problems blah, blah, blah. i'm like look I don't give a shit about any of that. No. You were supposed to pin up. You didn't. And the thing is, as a student, students can get away with that because what are the repercussions? The grades are inflated anyway. Okay, so you look bad for a little bit. They might not give a shit. No. In practice, why did you miss the deadline? Why did you make a mistake on the CDs or the permits? Uh, 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 no, there's no answer, actually. You screwed it up. Don't do that again. Because the reputation's on the line. Lots of money's on the line. I mean, it's like really the serious stuff. The clients that I have to pay, it's going like, to take you, more time. Like, yeah. I think once you start working and you start seeing like buildings being taken down yeah. and a big hole in the dirt where the building used to be, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're like, yeah. oh shit, like when it's start, getting real. When they start pouring foundations, you're like, I hope that's in the right place. I hope you know, that we didn't I mean, cord mess up with the coordination between foundation structure and whatever else, or they, they're hauling a giant beam, steel beam, you're like... I hope to God that's the right beam and it's in the right that's place. That's the thing, you know, we just talked about being scared uh, and, and the first question about like the transition between school to uh, to working at an office. <laughs> Once you're in an office, your level of being scared shift to yeah. things that are actually very scary yeah. financially and, and physically and legally and all of those things. Um, yeah, I remember going to like coordination meetings with like all kinds of engineers looking at, you know, like all of the very technical plans and like discovering we have a bunch of problems in the ceiling and and like resolving it and then you're hoping that the next week when they start pouring slabs that <clears throat> what you figured out is actually going to work and that they won't figure out anything else and i mean it's it's the level of of thoroughness 
and detailedness and accuracy is way, way higher uh, what's required uh, when you're practicing than when you're a student. Oh, of course, of course. Um, well, and you're not, you're not, again, you're not on your own. Like you're actually dealing with a lot of other people yeah. on the project, depending on the type of project you work on, but at least a contractor on the smallest end and like, you know, five or six or more consultants on the other end of the spectrum. So your shit is not just your shit. Your shit is becoming everybody's shit. Yeah. <laughs> so if you mess up, then you everyone make, at it's that like table a domino looks at effect. You. Like yeah. you make everyone else's mess up. Yeah. And yeah. uh, they got 10 people looking at you like, okay, why is that line there? That line shouldn't be there on the drawing. That that line on the drawing tells me the beam is located somewhere. Or this beam, these two lines are shifted by two feet. Why did you put those lines there? And you're like, I don't know, man. They're fucking lines. <laughs> I know. I know. So <laughs> and, you know, and and a, and a smaller example. I remember. I think it was the first or maybe the second job. I don't remember. One one of the first two jobs I had, I was working at an office, and I was in charge of putting together this presentation. And I think a lot of um, you know new hire, fresh graduates are put in charge of more of the graphic kind of things, not technical stuff, um, yeah. construction stuff like we were mentioning, but uh, pre presentations. And it was a presentation that was putting together, and um, I was going to accompany the partner, uh, the two partners to uh, out of state uh, because the project was out of state, and they were going to make this presentation to uh, the board. <laughs> and, um, and it's a big deal for me because I'm a young kid, and to be in a car... Uh, with two partners to have my hotel room in, a, in another state. Like, it was a big deal, you know? Got my little rolling suitcase. <laughs> got my little dress shoes on. And um, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> and uh, we get to the to the to one of the presentations room. And, you know, I think when you're a student, you think of a presentation, you think of, oh, it's on a, well, now it's on a big flat screen that's maybe 52 inches in, in a studio. It's on a projector in a room that's going to house 30 people or 12 people, or you pin it up on the wall. And we get there and this, there's this, there's two presentations. And I think the first one was in, you know, some kind of conference room setting. And so the presentation was being projected. It was like 20 feet, 25 feet by like 15 feet was like the size. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> And there's all these people sitting in the room, and there's a fucking typo. Oh, no. A fucking oh, the typo. the feeling in your heart when that happens. And the thing was, <gasps> no one was in the room yet, so it was just me and the partner were loading it. Did you make the typo? Oh, I made the typo. Oh, no. And um, I think we loaded the, the thing, and he or I were flying through it to kind of see, and there's just a typo. And of course, the typo on my monitor at my desk was like a little ladybug. And here on the screen, it's like this giant cow. <laughs> it was something dumb, too. It was like the word project was not project. It was like projects or something strange. There was something, something. And I was I was mortified. Of course, the partner who saw it, he's like, there's a typo. And I was like, oh, my God. So I'm scrambling to try and fix it. He's like, no, it's there. It's done. Let's have a walk. Let's go look at the campus or whatever else. And we could I could have fixed because there was time. But he's like, nope. The, the, the mistake's been made. We're not going to try and panic and fix it right now by you opening up the InDesign or whatever else. We're going to do what we're going to do, what we would plan, which is to, you know, go get lunch and walk around the campus, and that's what it's going to be. And I always wondered, I think there were two things as to reasons why he said that. One, the typo probably was not as a big of a deal as it was to me. Um, still really bad look. And two, the lesson that I, the, how I took it was like, you know, how do I put this? Like in school, everyone's always panicking at the last minute to finish. And even when you finish, you can always kind of like fix things at the last second, right? There's always some student who's, and I didn't really ever do this, I don't think, but there's always some student who's printing at the last second or like, you know, fixing stuff as they're drawing, yeah. like last minute fixes. And I, the lesson that I took away from it was like, no, we don't do that. That's not what happens in a professional setting. You do it right and on time or you don't. If you don't, then you miss it and you don't do it again. But there's none of this, uh, I'm going to, freak out and, and be flustered around in front of people to try and solve this this thing um and i i did not make that mistake again i can tell you for sure not to my knowledge at least <laughs> and then the other meeting we had as part of the same trip was a smaller room but it was with the board and there was like 20 people and i i remember again i was i was i was like oh my gosh i hope that because no one else was checking the work it was my responsibility 
It's like, oh my, and I didn't think this was going to be the case. Um, and you realize things become, because we're pitching. And it's like, well, if we don't look good because of some mistake I made, these people in the room, they don't know I made the presentation. The partner's not going to say, well, sorry for that. We have a new person. They started and they made the mistake. They matter. for sure are not going to say that. They would look terrible. It would look worse. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, that is a big difference from school is that it's not about you anymore. It's about the office. Yeah. You know, like it, it, you don't exist as a single entity within the environment. Like you are representing the office and whatever work comes out of your head and your hands is the work of the office. So, and I think that all of that probably scares the, the, the two people who wrote in and the listeners more than anything else. <laughs> They're like, okay, well now I'm really freaked out. But as you said, though, you're not alone. Even if you're giving a massive responsibility, you're still not alone. So, I mean, you know, design presentations, the typo is not the worst thing. But when it comes to that final, that last check, you can always ask somebody. Like, and that's how it should be. You're not alone. And, you know, even if you make mistakes, well, just, you know, say you've, you've made a mistake. Acknowledge that like, you're the one who made the mistake. And then if you want to avoid making a mistake, well, ask someone in the office to check your shit. You know, mm -hmm. ask if someone would volunteer to... Okay, you're drawing. Make sure like you're not drawing things that don't make sense at all. You know, and and it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I can't think of anything else at the moment um, in response to the question of what to expect and you know what's different from you know the preparation. Again, I think we kind of covered it. I, I think that maybe this is not a helpful answer, but I, I honestly feel like there's not much you can do to prepare. There's not there's not a way for you to like gain in the span of a, a few summers enough tangible quantifiable knowledge to make you more prepared for an office uh, i think internships is maybe one thing but like aside from that i on your own i think it's just Women. mentally gearing up for it and being prepared to for some of the pressures that we mentioned yeah um one last thing i was thinking of and i think we mentioned that in previous recordings is you could reach out to alumni from your school who've been working for the last year or two. Yeah. They might have some good tips. Mm -hmm. Again, like, think about, it's always about like, okay, who do I know? Who do I know that I could ask questions? Who do I know that I could meet up with? Who do I know that might have some advice that they could give me? Mm -hmm. And who do I need to know to get those advice is also another way to reach out to strangers, right? Yeah. So, you know, you start with your friends, with your family, with your teachers, and then like what, who else was in my school, and then who's in my town, who's in the town that I want to, or the city I want to be in, who's in the firm I want to be in. Like you have a whole network of people you could reach out to have coffee, ask questions, ask advice. Like what did they do? Just even just hear their story might help you feel more confident, or just kind of like put things in in picture a little bit. I agree with that, and I I think that. Having that long-term perspective that I mentioned earlier is 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 key to relieving some of the the stress. I think the anxiety that comes with the transition, and also realizing to what you're saying, in response to what you're saying, that you know your the people around you are your greatest asset if you know how to leverage them and talk to with them. And it's something I would advise um, uh, a, a new graduates to do sooner than later is learn how to talk to people, mm -hmm. learn how to. Uh, we had a lot of practice because of the show. And that's been very beneficial for me, um, but learn that sooner than later. I, you know, I, w it, I wish I, w I wish I had done that personally yeah. before the podcast. Yeah, I think the podcast really kind of highlighted that to to us and to me, and I think that's something I, 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 I should have done. I could have done, and I should have done, and that would have probably helped me a little bit faster, mm -hmm. and I would have met more people. You know, like so. Yeah, don't under underestimate the people around you. Yeah. I mean, and because you, you have to find out who they are anyway, and if you meet them and you have a drink with them, and then they, you realize well, this person is kind of a dud, or I don't like them, then you stay away from them. Um, but it's good to build your your database. I don't mean a database in terms of people, but the database that they have feeds into yours, mm -hmm. right? The knowledge that they have is it's good to build it up. Um, soon well and we also briefly talked about mentorship you know within meeting or talking to these people maybe you're gonna get a, or have a special connection with one of them you know and eventually maybe that could be a person that you can call more than once mm -hmm. if you needed advice you know throughout your career or like on projects or you know for whatever like i think it's good to, to just being able to have those options yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. I think this is good. Should we give an outro? Give us an outro. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode once again. If you like the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also subscribe on uh, Spotify and YouTube. We are on most social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, although Twitter not so much. Yeah, it's just Instagram. Um, we have the website, secondstudiopod.com, where mm-hmm. all the episodes are available, as well as some video clips, transcript, work images of our guests, and all kinds of other things. Uh, what else? We have the hotline. Two one three two two two, six nine five zero. Yep. Then you can uh, send a text message or leave a voicemail like these two students did, basically. Um, if you want to give them more tips, you can reach out to us so we can share the information with them. And that's it. We have a lot more coming up, so please um, stay tuned. Share with your colleagues, with your office, <laughs> with your family. Um, you know, it always helps. Yeah. And uh, please keep listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions. And if you have advice, I like that. If you're a person yeah, who's employed, you have like, advice, oh, I have a different opinion of what you said, then tell us. That or let's say you you just, you know, went through that like six months ago or a year ago and you maybe had other ways to go about it. I think it's great to share yep. uh, those tips. So feel free to reach out to us. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. 